Hello History Fox, uh, I'm Gigi. In today's video, I will be accompanying you. I'm not an historian, <laughs> I'm just a regular dude. So I will be just asking things I'm curious of. What we will be talking about today? So for today's episode, I prepared a little bit about the uh, Islamic Golden Age, especially about the uh, contributions of the scientists from the Arab world or the Muslim world to sciences, culture, because I think it's too often forgotten that it was not just the Western world who contributed to sciences, that there was like a period of time, really long period of time, from the 8th to the 13th century, like 500 years or even more. Some historians, they even say it uh, went till the 13th or 14th century. So a really long period of time when it was not the Western world who dominated sciences and cultural development that it was actually like more Central Asia, the Arab world, also India. And I just thought it would be nice to talk about this part of history. I'm definitely curious because, as you said, the main narrative uh, around scientific enlightenment and progress is, is all generally starts with the uh, Renaissance, right? That's the main narrative. This is what we hear, especially in West, in Western rhetoric. But actually, there is whole buildup coming to that. So I'm really curious of the uh, learning some of the really important names and that's especially important because these names are really coming from like a scientific questioning perspective, really empirical perspective. It's not just about, you know, uh, military progress or military science, but it's actually really positive science we see. Yeah, as you already said, the scientific contributions and also like the scientific approach in general was something totally new. And so if there would have been like a Nobel Prize already a thousand years ago, they would have all gone to the Muslim scientists or Arab scientists. Today, Islam, there's a lot of prejudices around Islam, especially in the Western world. It's mostly associated with like conquering and conservatism. Yeah, unfortunately. But actually, core, what Islam means, is also spread knowledge, gaining knowledge. So in the 10th century after Muhammad, the Muslim empire went from the Iberian Peninsula, like Portugal and Spain, what was then known as Al-Andalus, today it's Andalusia, went till like the Indian border, went from North Africa to Central Asia, Mesopotamia. It was like a huge empire and there was like a cultural center, especially in Baghdad at that time. And this is where kind of the Islamic Golden Age started. So there was this so-called Abbasid Caliphate and one of them was uh, Harun al-Rashid. So Harun al-Rashid is kind of uh, associated a lot with the uh, House of Wisdom. Sounds super cool. It's some kind of, <laughs> uh, was an academic institution or some kind of library, um, which was founded in Baghdad. And all of the scientists from the Muslim world, they came to Baghdad to become part of the House of Wisdom. And it all started actually with uh, translations. So they took what they found from the great Hellenistic times, uh, like Aristotle, Ptolemy, Hippocrates, this um, Galen, for example, and they translated from Greek or Syriac to Arabic languages. And why did they do that? And why didn't the, the Europeans, the people in the Roman Empire didn't do that? Because they, they were not that interested. The Roman Empire, they had all of this knowledge from the Greeks, but they um, did not use it actually. So as it was in Islam, really important to gain knowledge, to multiply knowledge. They were really happy about what the Greeks left. So they bought all of the stuff from Europe, from the Romans, and they also got some Christian scientists, Christian scholars, because they knew Greek and they knew how to translate. So those Christian scholars came and those Muslim scholars learned how to read Greek, how to translate. And so it all started with a big translation movement, actually, but they did not stop there. Of course, they were translating, but they were also then developing their original ideas by basing their science on the translation. They did. Can we say this institution is uh, one of the early examples of a university? That's a good question. <laughs> um, so I wouldn't say so because it was more like an institution. There was like um, a pretty small circle of scholars coming together for discussions, to debate, also to translate, to develop new ideas, more like a research center. But of course, the first universities already existed kind of around that time, like in the ninth century, the first university uh, also appeared actually in Morocco, in Fez, founded by a woman, actually, Fatma al Fidi, And soon after that, in the 11th century, in Bologna, also like one of the first universities of uh, Europe were founded. And so what made that translation movement also happening in the House of Wisdom was a contribution from China, was the paper making. So till then, like, 
paper or what was what they used to write on was parchment or papyrus and it was kind of difficult to produce when they conquered Samarkand in 751 they also had a lot of Chinese prisoners and they used their knowledge it was not like they came there arrogantly like okay we put now our knowledge because we know everything best or better on you we are better we conquered you here you have to live like we do you have to know what we do you have to speak like we do no they were really pragmatic yeah they they used what they found there the knowledge they chinese already developed over centuries they were like okay hey you know what i know we use parchment we use papyrus but you know what your kind of paper it's much easier to produce because they produced it like out of out of cloth you know it was pretty easy and with the arabic scripture it was very elegant scripture also today you know it's very fluently to, to write it much easier to write than the latin scripture so they could write fast they could write a lot and they had like an easy to produce material to write on so in those centuries uh, the house of wisdom was popular or existed it was like a vast production of books and knowledge and scriptures and starting from translation by this technology transfer from china this translation movement was like the base of what was upcoming what was like the new ideas the new science is developing so you said there was a difference in the process of paper production and you said the chinese paper was made of you said clothes uh, what do you mean by that you mean by material or you mean by a different process how did that differ to how muslim people produce papyrus or paper it differed because parchment was made out of um, animal leather so it was also a very hard long-lasting very dirty procedure to make parchment and also papyrus is made out of a special plant comes from you know egypt it was also very difficult to produce because it was made out of those fibers of the plant You have to put this together, you have to press it. And the way the Chinese did paper out of the cloth was just much easier. I just wanted to say a little anecdote I like. It was when Harut al-Rashid reigned over Baghdad and there was a transfer, also a knowledge transfer, diplomatic transfer between Europe and the Muslim world, the Caliphate. And so Harun al-Rashid sent some delegates to Charlemagne, the king of the Franks, and he sent a water clock there. Water clock, it was like precision engineering clock using water and the scholars around Charlemagne, they were so amazed by this. They, they kind of freaked out. They thought this is, must be possessed. <laughs> How can a clock work like that with water? Because they were not nearly there where the Muslim scholars had been. So also still in the 18th century, like a thousand years after that water clock was presented to Charlemagne, Voltaire was still writing about that water clock. And he wrote in a little arrogant manner, Harun al-Rashid's striking clock gift to Charlemagne was regarded as a wonder. Regarding cognitive philosophy, sound philosophy, physics, astronomy and principles of medicine, how could they have been known to Muslims? These had only just been known to us. So a little bit arrogant, like, hey, we Europeans, you know, we, we know all this stuff. How, how could they invent something like this? Of, of course, a little bit like, you know, from Sorry. arrogant. But also appreciating the knowledge and the sciences. And that like even a thousand years after that water clock, they were still amazed by that precision engineering. But of course, now we can also come to the people behind that, to the engineers, to the mathematics, to those poly math people who made the golden age, the golden age. So I guess the name who comes first into mind when thinking about Islamic golden ancient sciences is the name of Ibn Sina or the Latinized version. We know him more in the Western world as Avicenna. He was polymath. So he was, a, he was a mathematician, he was a philosopher, he was a physicist. But of course, he is mostly known nowadays as a kind of a doctor. He wrote this big canon of medicine, which was widely popular and known among Europe till the 18th century. They used that as their base work to study medicine. So how particularly the canon of medicine influenced medical practices in the Middle Ages and beyond? So what was so special about um, Ibn Sina and uh, like generally his approach to science and to medicine was like that he put together the, the Greek knowledge and uh, knowledge from the Muslim world. So he based everything he learned on the, the Greeks, but was not without doubt. And this book kind of became the medical textbook till like the 17th, 18th century for all Uh, medical students in whole Europe because they translated it from the Arabic later to Latin. And in this book, for example, he correctly wrote about the uh, anatomy of the eye and a lot of an anatomical studies, you know, and in, in the European world was, for example, kind of not allowed to do these studies to open a dead body. 
and to do these kind of procedures. But in the Muslim world, it was for the scientific purpose. It was allowed to, you know, use a dead body to do medical studies. So he did all of those anatomical studies. So he also found out, for example, that tuberculosis is contagious, which kind of si sounds like totally banal to us. Of course, it's contagious, you know, it's a virus. Uh, but back then, medicine was kind of based on this Greek perception of the four liquids of the body. You have blood, you have phlegm, and you have black and yellow bile. And so if you like your four liquids are in imbalance, then you get sick. So the statement of it's contagious and that it can also be cured like from the outside, not like, for example, by those bleeding procedures, which they tend to do uh, based on this uh, humorism approach. Um, that was really new. That was something special. And he was also the first one to describe the symptoms of diabetes. And he had some studies on facial paralysis and even like psychiatric disorders. So kind of mental health studies based on medicine and not like Pocus pocus. <laughs> so we kind of come back to what was also so special about those scientists is that they base their results or their studies on hypotheses that has to be proven by experiments. And they have to have a mathematical base or they, you know, that the other scientists, they could redo those experiments, for example, and come up with the same result. And of course, there we have to also name Al-Hassan, even al Cham because he is kind of perceived as the first true scientist because uh, he was the one who was writing about this kind of approach. Like he put that in words that if you do scientific research, you have to base your hypotheses on experiments. Like you have to have a proof and those experiments, they have to be based on uh, confirmable procedures and mathematical reasoning. So that also like your scientific, like your colleague, uh, he or someone in Europe or somewhere in the other corner of the world who reads that, can redo that, do the same experiment and come to the same conclusion. So that was for us now, it's kind of, yeah, of course, you, you can't just say something without a base. But back then it was like, oh my God, Herika, Harika. <laughs> also in Renaissance, they did the same. They took that, what those Muslim scientists found out and they used this then for their um, scientific development. And what was also like kind of new is, of course, people were always fascinated by light. What is the nature of light. In Greek times, it was kind of commonly accepted knowledge to think about light as something related to optics, to your eye. Like you, your eye is kind of giving some beams to the outside, like eye beams. And this is how you see. You have those beams, they figure out the structure, like scanning and then giving this information back to you. But Al-Hassan, he was the first one who kind of thought about differently what light could be. So he was actually uh, thinking about, hey, light could also be like traveling waves coming from the sun and reflecting from an object traveling to your eye. Of course, nowadays we know about this dual nature of light, that it is like particles and waves at the same time. But that was super new. And there we come to one of his colleagues, uh, Al-Biruni. So when you say colleagues, are we referring to people who lived in the same years together in parallel? Or is it more like kind of like a flag race, you know? They lived one after each other and they kind of transferred the knowledge to each other. So of course, we can say it was more like a flag race. But interestingly, Al-Biruni Avicenna and uh, Al-Hazan lived actually at the same time. So, and there was also like a very nice correspondence between Al-Biruni and Ibn Sina. They were writing letters to each other and they were really discussing, they were actually fighting about their approach to Aristotle. A lot of their knowledge was based on Aristotle and uh, Ibn Sina, he had just a different opinion. Maybe he was a little bit arrogant actually because he had a lot of his knowledge uh, already in mind. He was already convinced before even starting to experiment that this will be the outcome. So he kind of just used an experiment, you know, to, to be like, oh yeah, I was right <laughs> from, from the beginning. So Al-Biruni, on the other hand, he used an approach we would today call falsification. So he was the first one who tried to break out of this Aristotelian Ptolemaic worldview because he also used experiment to prove himself wrong, which would um, Ibn Sina wouldn't have done. <laughs> Coming back to the question of light, if I may. <laughs> so Al-Biruni, he was also one of those polymaths, you know, and it is so sad that he is not as known as Ibn Sina and Al-Hassan today. As Al-Hassan, he was also thinking about the waves nature of light, but he was also thinking about the velocity. He was sure that light must be faster than 
sound. And that was also kind of the revolution in, in thinking. Now you, you may think, wasn't Alberoni the guy with the measurements of the earth? Yes. So he was also a polymath. So he was not just about geographical studies, mathematics, but also optics. He was interested in all of those different fields and he did contributions to all of this, this different field which were then later in Renaissance times used by the European scientists for their scientific evolution. So it's just a shame that today Alberuni is more forgotten than, for example, than Ibn Sina or an al Hassan, because he had major contribution, especially around the measurements of the planet. And as you can imagine back then, they did not have a lot of instruments to use, like for example, a telescope came later with an astrolabe, an instrument used by astronomers, and, and a stick. And with a lunar eclipse, he was able to measure, for example, longitudes and latitudes of the planet and kind of really exactly. But I think what is mostly exceptional was his measurement of the Earth radius. Using this simple instruments he had, he come, came up with the number at the end of 6,339.6 kilometers radius. And the modern value is actually 6,371 which is just around like, what, 30 meters apart. How did he manage to do that? Talking about Middle Ages here. So this precision is really, really deserves admiration. I also want to ask, how did Al Bruni's cultural and comparative studies help bridge gaps between different civilizations? He was in the courtesy, is this how you say it, of the then Caliph. So he was traveling around with him. The Caliph was always kind of surrounded by his most favorite scholars. So the scholars, when they came with the Caliph to the conquest, they made some researches about yeah, cartography, also about the, the culture they found there, the languages in the new areas. It is especially to mention when Albiruni came to India with the conquests of the Caliph he accompanied, that he wrote a huge study about Indian culture, Indian history. And for centuries, they used technology wrote down there because it was very objective. And so in this, I think it's called Kitab al-Hindi, where he wrote about the Indian world. It gave the first point of view about what is happening at the other end of the world. I also need to point out that the Indian scholars, they also contributed a lot to, you know, modern sciences, especially in mathematics. The numbers we have today, it's actually the Indian Arabic numbers. So Al-Biruni, for example, and especially al Khwarizmi, <laughs> a new name, they were like, okay, hey, you know what? The numbers the Indians use, they're kind of cooler. They're, they're, they're easier to use. They are more understandable. They, they brought those numbers from India to the Arabic world. And later from the Arabic world, they went to Europe, to the Latinized world. And now, nowadays, the whole world is using these numbers. And maybe now we come to yeah, al Khwarizmi uh, because he was kind of pushing forward the use of the new of a new number, the number zero. He was like, hey, you know what? We need that. We need to kind of use this number zero to fill out the void. He has actually called it the void, which back then was said as cifre. You can already heard that cifre, cifre, cifre. In English, it's zero. So it, it comes from from then and generally al khwarizmi is nowadays called the father of algebra because he wrote a book called i need to check that name al kitab al mutasa fihi sab al gabr the al mukabala which translates to a concise book of uh, calculations based on editing and calculating so the work for editing was kind of algebra and that was then later latinized into algebra and also his name in general um, al khwarizmi's name we find it today in the word algorithm so yeah we have a lot of fathers here we have the father of algebra al khwarizmi we have the father of medicine um, avicenna we have like the, the father of geodesy with albiruni <laughs> i i also want to ask you about hunayn ibn ishaq uh, because you mentioned about the um, translation movement, which I believe is actually the foundation of this golden age of Islamic um, uh, scientific enlightenment. Uh, can you also elaborate or give some information on Hunayn ibn Ishaq and his importance? So, of course, when we talk about the translation movement, we also have to name him Hunayn ibn Ishaq. I hope I said it correctly. Um, because he was kind of the one who started this whole translationing 
stuff. So he was actually Christian. This is also proof that like the Islamic Golden Age was not just about Muslim scholars, but they had also Christian, even even Jewish scholars that were contributing to this scientific development and success. He was collecting the knowledge from the Greeks, which was like left, what was not lost. Some of the works of Aristotle, Ptolemy, Galenov, uh, Pergamon, Hippocrates, they started to, to translate that. So, so you mentioned a few things. Um, actually, you mentioned about this institute where even the Christians and Muslims were working together on scientific topics. You mentioned about um, studying bodies. Of course, it's the same in Christianity where dead bodies, of course, are holy and there's like, you know, the whole uh, ritual around it. But uh, we see in a very, very early ages approaching uh, these bodies from scientific perspective and studying them. So what I see is defining the Islamic golden age. The key word is pragmatism. It's really pragmatic. I want to ask your opinion uh, because in today's world, um, of course, there are different views, but Islamic world uh, tend to seem struggling with um, innovation and scientific uh, enlightenment. Or let's say there are some struggles in the Islamic world today where we see, especially in some, some geographies, conservatism is taking over. So I'm, I'm curious of your opinion. What happened there? Like what happened, this golden age of Islamic world started to really slow down or um, is it the natural, you know, flow of things, things go rise and then fall? What's your opinion on this? That's a really interesting question. First, I would like to come back to this pragmatism. Like pragmatism is many times the base of innovation because like what is necessary, you, you, you have to do and you have to find kind of the easiest way to do it and sometimes it's based on you know a lot of science a lot of research but then you have kind of an easy way to do it so we came from abacus you know you know abacus you know how the thing you you, you used to calculate back in the days to a uh, calculator on your phone so this is much easier right but it, it took like centuries of knowledge and in the islamic golden age it was also based on pragmatism because like as i already said like in islam the, the gaining and you know nourishing from knowledge is kind of part of, of Islam, actually. So that's also why the caliphs, they were patronizing a lot of those scholars. They were coming from all over the Muslim world to Baghdad to do their researches. Also, because of just some very pragmatic questions. Um, for example, in Islam, there is this, I think it's called Qibla. Um, it's like your positioning when you do your prayer. You, you are supposed to position yourself towards Mecca. And when you don't see Mecca, you don't see the Kaaba close by, then it's always the question, okay, how do I position myself? And so a lot of the cartographers, the mathematicians, the astronomers, they wanted to answer this question. How can a Muslim who's living like somewhere in the mountains, how should he know or she know how to position him or herself, you know, to fulfill their religious duties? But also like the positioning of the moon, so they know when the Ramadan, the month of feasting will start. So the question was, how can I fulfill my religious duties the best? So yeah, very pragmatic. And then it kind of declined. I mean, it was, as I said, in the beginning centuries, even a thousand years of golden age of sciences and culture and then what happened it came like kind of from the outside it was an invasion from the Mo mongol empire and then baghdad and the house of wisdom they got destroyed in the year 1258 um, at the siege of baghdad and then the muslim world the muslim empire kind of fell apart declined because there were like a lot of different rulers uh, geographically wide apart it's very different to keep them organized stay together so difficult to rule difficult to find a common ground and so yeah then it went into this uh, decline and then what happened and that's kind of interesting to think about is what they call today the great divergence it's the question behind why those big empires who were ahead of the western world of the european sciences like the islamic empire also chinese the Korean, the, the Indian world, I mean, they had a lot, they, had, they were really ahead of Europe. But then suddenly they changed, they, they turned and it started from the 14th century with the start of the Renaissance in Europe, but even accelerated with industrialization. And then the Western world kind of got ahead. And the reasoning behind that could be is a lot of explanations, either pre-imperialism -imper or colonialism that they just had the resources, that they just had the economical advances. Some scientists, they even say it might just be like really chance, like luck, 
But it's of course difficult to think about that in that way. It was not just an accident. They were just the first ones, maybe at a certain point, those empires I mentioned, they would have also come to that point. But then it was already too late because the, the Europeans, the Western world, they kind of took over and they put their stamp on all the others. They started with the colonization and imperialism. And then the others kind of did not have the chance anymore to develop in the same direction. Because if you have one superpower, this superpower won't accept another one. I want to ask you, how much of the European Enlightenment and particularly the Renaissance actually coming from knowledge gain based on Islamic Golden Age? I'm just curious. Yeah, I think we often forget about that part. And as you already also said, this, this metaphor of a flag phrase, that's really nice. Um, that they based their knowledge on the Islamic Golden Age studies who based their knowledge on the Greek sciences and studies. So it's not like there's just one culture, one dominant region who contributes everything to sciences. It was all like kind of a big teamwork. <laughs> the Arabic studies or what they translated from Greek to Syriac and Arabic was then later translated again to Latin and Hebrew. So it could be also studied in Europe. So it was a collaborative approach. They um, used like the canon of medicine of Avicenna for, for their medical researches. They used the, the mathematical um, studies of al khwarizmi And also maybe what is also lesser known is that in the Islamic Golden Age, there was even the thought about kind of evolution. I mean, of course, they did not name that evolution yet. I mean, that kind of came with Darwin in the 19th century. But it's interesting to think about that. Even in that time, there were, for example, uh, Al-Tuzi or Ibn Khaldun, who were already thinking about something they called the struggle of existence, which is actually evolution, right? They were thinking about actually humans are some kind of derived or like kind of a mutation from animals. And then they were thinking about what animal looks like humans. And then they were like, hey, yeah, how about monkeys? And then they even were like, okay, maybe it started all in Africa. So they even had that idea like in the 13th and 14th century that we are coming from the animal kingdom. We are coming from apes. Later, that knowledge was, of course, then used by the Europeans. And I don't think Darwin did come up with that, like, out of nothing. <laughs> Maybe he also based his works on, you know, already existing works, like Copernicus did. Maybe he came up with that idea by himself, but he used some of the methods, some of the instruments invented by the um, Muslim scholars. So the idea of the heliocentric system doesn't come from Copernicus, but already the Muslim scholars were having that idea. And if you even go back in time, the Greeks, Aristotelus of Samos, had that idea or like 300 years before Christ. So that the earth is round, that it is not center of our planetary system, but that it's like a solar system because the sun is in the center, were already existing ideas. Well, yeah, I mean, that's really, really shocking for me uh, because there was uh, Islamic scholars in the Middle Age, in the Golden Age of Islam, who actually thought about the idea of evolution and entertained the idea like maybe this can happen and they were not murdered. Uh, so... Even in the today's world where we call like modern times, right, information age in some Islamic countries, talking about evolution is still a taboo. So thank you so much uh, for your work. It's, I think it's really inspiring for also people who are watching us from Islamic worlds that this heritage is there and it just requires to look at things differently. They questioned things, they were pragmatic and they really relied on the scientific approach. I learned a lot today. Thank you so much. Is there anything else you would like to add? I need to say I also learned a lot <laughs> because, of course, I also come from Europe and I also kind of start always with this European approach. But when you reflect on it, when you see like from different perspectives, what we unfortunately not do a lot, we see we are not the center of the universe in Europe. There were already this kind of scientists, this knowledge, those great people. They existed in the Muslim world, in India, in, in Africa, in America, everywhere. There were everywhere people who were curious, who were open-minded. And I think we should really remember their contribution. Thanks to them, we are where we are today. And it's always good to come from different point of views and to change perspective. History Fox, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> so... If you got curious, if you're interested in other forgotten parts of history, then feel free to subscribe to my channel or click here.